Ladies and gentlemen, the Pegasus story has exactly, as I had warned on Monday, turned out to be the biggest hoax of the year. Maybe one of the biggest hoax stories of a decade. The author of the hoax report, Amnesty International, has now virtually disowned the outlandish claims that media houses who participated in this strange hoax operation had made. Now, accepting that it has no proof, Amnesty has accepted, and I quote, that there is no certainty that Pegasus spyware from NSO was ever used in this, unquote. For the last two days, you've seen sections of the Indian media discrediting the Pegasus project. They've trashed the report, they've declared the list completely baseless and questioned the legitimacy of the entire investigation. This was done using one article written by an Israeli journalist, Omer Kabir. Today, we're in conversation with that very Israeli journalist, Omer Kabir, to get a real understanding of what exactly this confusion was about. Omer is a climate crisis and tech reporter with Calculist, an Israeli news organization, and he's been reporting on the NSO for the last five years. Welcome to News Laundry, Omer. Thank you for taking the time out. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Hey, Omer, we wanted to begin by asking you, is this your first interaction with the Indian media? And how would you describe the last two days? Um, yes, it's the first interaction uh, with Indian media. Obviously, as a reporter, I sometimes read Indian press, mostly Times of India, but I never really interacted with Indian reporters, I guess, on a this intense basis. Um, it's been very intense. You know, it was uh, yesterday morning I started getting uh, emails, WhatsApp messages, LinkedIn messages, Facebook messages. Uh, even someone found my private email somehow from various uh, news organizations in India. I had no idea why they turned to me because a lot of reporters in Israel wrote about the story. Uh, my colleague had, had an idea that maybe my name sounded somewhat uh, Indian to them, Omer Kabir, I don't know. Uh, but I, did, I had, had no idea what was happening, but uh, they asked me to interview. I understood it was just my story about the, the amnesty statement that they put out the day before. And uh, I agreed because uh, it's an important issue. I've been covering NSO, as you said, for, for the past five years. I think I'm one of the um, journalists that are most familiar uh, with the company in the world. Uh, so I, inter I, to interview, I agreed to, interview to present uh, the facts as I see them. Right. And what were the Indian reporters really asking you? And were you surprised by their questions? I wasn't surprised. Because I, I'm used to there's been a, there's been a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding around NSO uh, in the press. Uh, in the press, they are not covering it uh, regularly because the company does operate not in full transparency. And what it does, it's not very clear to everybody. It's somewhat secretive. Uh, uh, for its nature of operation force it to be secretive. Uh, I know a lot of countries there's, are, uh, there's media that is uh, one-sided or leans to one side. So, and I had a guess, I had an inkling that my story that could be seen as discrediting the previous report 
might be used by some media to discredit the report, even though it does not uh, actually. So I had, and, and I had a suspicion when some uh, news organization, organization approached me that maybe they are aligned with the, with the government as there are in every country. In Israel, there are news organizations that are more aligned with the government. So, and maybe they will want me to say, uh, Maybe they want me to say that the report is uh, unfactual or untrue, or the findings are a lie or fake news. And I did get a sense that they were trying to tease the sort of this statement out of me. And this was another reason that it was important for me to say yes to all of the interviews, because I knew I can present the facts in a well, uh, in a balanced and uh, honest way, because there are problems with the report, in my opinion. But there are some true facts, and it was important for me to stretch what is truth and based in a research and what is more conjecture. Okay. And you know, before we go on to what exactly happened in the last few days, I want to get an understanding if you can tell us uh, about NSO. You know, is it viewed as notoriously in Israel as it is being viewed across the world right now? That's a good question. It's very famous in Israel. Uh, not just now, but for the last, uh, I say, let's say two years. Uh, I started reporting on it five years ago, but only like the last couple of years, it really became more notorious. Uh, since it's an Israeli company, it's a lot less one-sided. You know, if you go to Western, to Western countries, there will be a lot of voices against it. Here it will be more balanced. There will be people who say, well, they are doing something important. They are helping stop a terrorist, which is true. They are helping stop pedophile, which is also true. And there will be a lot of other voices like myself and other journalists and other uh, researchers and activists that will say, while this is true, there are also a lot of countries misusing its program to persecute journalists, human rights activists, dissidents, lawyers, and other political figures. Uh, if you hear of the company is divided, but there is a lot of criticism from my publication, from Haaretz, which is another uh, major publication which criticizes NSO regularly. There's a lot, and for a lot of, uh, from a lot of research in academia, like uh, Teila Schwarzal Schuler or uh, Professor Karina Horn, these are some of the researchers that have been uh, outspoken and vocal about NSO. Right. And, you know, as a journalist, and especially as someone who's covered the NSO for so long, um, what is your assessment about the Pegasus project? How do you view it? Because a lot of the Indian media right now, sections of the Indian media, is really seriously questioning the legitimacy of this report. Um, so I want to know from you, what is your assessment of the Pegasus project? Well, uh, it's a good question. And first, I think there should be some disclosure here it's important for your uh, audience that uh, m- my competitors, Haaretz, is part of the Forbidden Stories Consortium and part of the reporting unit. So they are my competitors. So just so you know that I am not coming to this unbiased. Uh, I think the project is problematic in the way it presented the list. Mm. The list of 50,000 phone numbers was in all the reports was tied to NSO, though indirectly every report from the original uh, stories consortium tied the list to NSO. So this is a list of NSO of numbers that are, that are of interest to NSO clients. And one of the problem, A, they never made clear the source of the list and they are still not making it clear. They said just yesterday I talked with the Amnesty spokesperson in Israel Gil Nave told me we can disclose the source of the list because uh, of uh, security concerns and uh, and we don't want to reveal our, our sources, which is a problem because you are making huge claims. You're connecting the list uh, to NSO indirectly, but connecting it with every report. You don't you do you don't didn't explain where the list came from. Why is it decided it was not of interest to NSO? Why? It was decided to link it to NSO and not some other company that are doing the same thing. Uh, just last week, I reported on another company, another Israeli company named Kandiru is pretty much unknown in the world right now, uh, or was before I reported about it, that had that its, its spyware was found on 100 devices uh, of journalists, human rights activists, dissidents, and this was uh, found by Microsoft. So it was a pretty, come from a pretty reliable source. 
and they have the same client. They share some clients like UAE and Saudi Arabia. So why wasn't the list connected to Kandiru? Why they didn't say this is a list of, of uh, people of interest to Kandiru's clients? Mm. Uh, they never explain it, which is problematic in my opinion. So you're saying that the list alone is one, there are a few people on the list who have been targeted by the Pegasus spyware, uh, some who could have potentially have been targeted by the spyware. And you're saying that apart from Pegasus, there might have been other spywares who might have been interested in some of these people on the list. Am I getting that right? Um, I'm not saying it, but you are correct. Actually, I didn't mean to say it, but yes, it's possible. Okay, I just want to backtrack a little. Uh, yeah. I want to talk about the other part of the report, which mm. is uh, the forensic analysis they did on 67 devices. They contact, I don't know how they, who they decide to contact and how people on the list mm. ask them to bring in their devices for forensic analysis in Amnesty's lab. 67 said yes. Of the 67 devices, there were traces of a Pegasus found on 37. Mm. Some were actually infected. 13 was just attempt to infect that didn't succeed. Mm. So, and these were all number from the list. And this part is very much reliable. They, were, they published the methodology very deeply. The methodology was peer reviewed and approved by a citizen lab from University of Toronto, which is the leading institute investigating NSO for the last five years. And uh, Citizen Lab also uh, reviewed four devices and confirmed there the, uh, the were traces on Pegasus on them. So this part of the report is accurate and it's very important because it's very serious. Mm. They found traces of Pegasus on 37 devices. I think they said 12 of them were of devices operated that belong to journalists. Other belong to a politician. I think one of them a high level politician in the French administration, I'm not sure. Other, I'm guessing they will come out in the next few days, will be some uh, human rights activists, this and this sort of stuff. Mm. This is the part of the report that is uh, un, uh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the word. This is undisputable or pretty much undisputable because NSO in, in, re, in common to this part of the report said, well, it's not true. And mm. I asked him, I, I, speak, I spoke with uh, Shalev, Shalev Kulios, the mm. CEO of NSO, CEO and father and so I spoke with him directly and he said, it's not true. It's not our devices. We checked. They, are not, they were not target of Pegasus. I say, and I tell him, how can you prove it? He said to me, basically, you have my word. His word is not enough when you have the mountain of evidence from the other side. So I just was clear to me the other part of the report because it's not like the whole thing is, in, is questionable. Mm-hmm. Um, you ask if the number of the list could be targeted by other companies. And this is now I need to make, I think it's important to make clear, what is the list list, right? Where are the numbers coming from? Yeah. And this is a big question. Yeah. Uh, NSO claimed, and we have verified this claim uh, ourselves and with other independent researcher. And this claim has not been disputed by Forbidden Stories and Amnesty. They didn't say this claim isn't true. So the claim, is, and so we believe that it's true that the list is came from an HLR lookup service. HLR lookup, so HLR lookup or HLR is a sort of a global network that connects all cellular operators. It enab- it's what enables you to call a number of another cellular operator in your country or another country and reach this number. So it's sort of, and it enables cellular operator to share basic information about the devices such as uh, which network is connected to, which operator, in which country, uh, is it roaming or isn't roaming, and is it online or offline? So it's a sort of a basic step when connecting to another dev- to a device in another network is using this HLR network. HLR lookup services are offered by some individual, by some companies, that enable to sort anyone who wants it to access basic information about the devices. It is used constantly uh, for a lot of legitimate reason by law enforcement around the world. Mm. One example of a legitimate use is, let's say uh, you are an officer investigating some sort of drug dealer. You have a legal tap on his phone line or his cell phone line. You have like a tap, a court order to tell you to listen to his calls on the phone line mm. to the cellular operator. So nothing like, nothing, not spying by Pegasus here in this case. 
and you see a number calling him that you don't recognize, he will search this number in a national local server just to know where is this call coming from, which network, how it might be connected to the suspect. So it has legitimate uses. It yeah. also has illegitimate uses. It might be a step in uh, installing a spyware on the company or, or another uh, illegal tapping or problematic tapping. So it might have other uh, illegitimate uses. Mm. And we believe that some NSO clients are using this sort of service before infecting a device. Mm. So we have a list of 50,000 numbers received from HR lookup service, some sort of HR lookup. Presumably, we are not sure, uh, operated, accessed by governments. Mm. And yes, some of the governments used the service before they infected, probably before they infected NSO devices, uh, sorry, devices with NSO. Mm. And we know it because according to NST, some of the devices appeared on the list just a second, a few seconds before they were targeted with Pegasus. Mm. But, but other devices maybe were looked up for legitimate reason or for illegitimate reason, not connected to NSO, which is also possible. We don't know why number is on the list. And uh, yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I'm talking very long. No, go on. I think <laughs> it's good it's okay. for us to have this clarity. I, actually, I was at the end of my answer. Yeah. No, but I just wanted to take a step back again and ask yeah. you. So a very simple question, you know, tomorrow, mm-hmm. if um, what is the process of being an NSO client? Like, you know, so if mm-hmm. I were the government and I wanted to spy on someone, do I send NSO a list? Is there multiple lists? Um, does my list have to be approved by NSO? What is really the process? Because I think there's a lot of confusion in terms of how that process itself happens. So do you want to know how you become a client? Or yeah, so once, once I, you're a client? Yeah, just walk me through the process of if I want, if I'm the government and I want to spy on someone using Pegasus, what do I do? Okay, so... If you are not a client yet, and again, uh, some of this is conjecture, some of this was published in court document because they, they, it's not like they advertise their operation. It's not like they put an ad on Facebook, can be our client. Mm-hmm. They work through intermediaries, through people with connection to governments. They sell directly to government. I think uh, Shalev actually, uh, I'm sorry, it's not Shalev, some sources uh, talk with it to my uh, colleague at uh, the market which is part of a Harvard, for Harvard School, I mean, ties in how the process work. Usually they will contact directly the government, the relevant people. If it's an authoritarian government, such as Saudi Arabia, they will usually go straight to the top because they will they get all decision top down. If it's a democratic government, they will work from the bottom, from the relevant agency until, until it percolates upwards to the relevant agency uh, or the relevant decision maker. And it's sort of done behind the scenes. With the intermediaries, they have some daughter companies in various countries. They have some companies that work as uh, sellers of the program. Uh, Usually it will be people with connection in that country. You know, a lot of countries in Africa have connection with uh, with various Israeli person. Sometimes this might be people who are uh, arms dealers. A lot Mm. of uh, arms dealers sells sells weapons to African countries or other countries. And they have connection with the government. So NSO might, and again, this is conjecture. It's nothing that has been proven, might work with these arm dealers because they already have connection in this country to sell their program to them. Okay. They, they have an internal evaluation process or they claim they have an internal evaluation process to rate each country on a scale and decide if this country can A, be a client and B, be a client of Pegasus. They have other, pro- they have other product they sell they have uh, some sort of uh, one product they sell. They have a search and rescue product, mm. which is based on cellular network, but not a uh, Pegasus. They sell, so they decide if this country can be a client and if this country can be, have access to the Pegasus, according to them, only 45 countries are actually Pegasus client. And they have, I think about 60 countries that are clients, but uh, 15 of them are not, do not have access to Pegasus. So this is how the client uh, acquisition part works. Yeah. And this actually, Julio, in the interview uh, said to you, right, that we have 45 clients at a time. Yes. And generally, each of the client can target about 100 uh, people that they can snoop on. Right. So I just Uh, want to know from you. I I have to ask my clear. They said they have 45 clients. And in average, each client has 100 targets a year. 
got it so my question then is uh, how believable is this information and i ask this because um, what is the conviction to believe nso when they say this that they have only 45 clients and like they can approximately target about 100 people because the their entire response apart from the interview that they've given to a few media organizations like yours mm-hmm. their entire response has been to discredit this list yeah. um yeah. and i mean almost similar to what the indian government here has done like instead of giving explanations there's been a constant attempt to discredit the list so as a journalist that makes me suspicious of why i should believe anything that nso is saying right so am i missing something or is that suspicion uh, is that something you suspect as well it is it is a suspicion we share i'm mm-hmm. very doubtful of everything the nso itself says because everything they say they can't they can or they want to back up with documents or other findings or other sources it basically uh, comes down to well you have to believe my word mm. uh, but there are things we know about how their system operates from various sources from cold document which is more believable because it's not that simple to lie in this valley court it has very serious repercussion mm. so some of the things that makes sense and when he says we have only 45 clients in and each one is uses the the system to target 100 phones in every year mm. it makes sense you know mm. it might not be true but it makes sense by the way we know how uh, how pegasus operates mm. you know they charge very high fees for mm. each license which is a license is a target so mm. it's not cheap to use pegasus it's a very very expensive system it's not a mess surveillance system the system that been targeted for in like in you know, so dozen of devices a year dozens not dozens dozens by with each client so it's not a mess of it's not like the country that has pegasus will now go and infect every citizen with mm-hmm. uh, with the, the software it's not possible uh, by the way the system is designed mm-hmm. and i think you asked earlier and i do want to clarify it how the system operates yeah does any so operate it does the client give the any so list of target and any so operate it doesn't work like that at all mm. each system is installed locally at the client it's come with it's a software and hardware combination it is installed locally at the client premises nso does not have access to the list to the uh, to the data in the system they do have access to the operating system to the operation side but they don't have access to the data and they don't operate it each client operates the the system by himself the system has some built-in limitations so let's say a client can't use the system to target numbers outside its country or in or in other countries it is it is claimed that the system is not operational in Israel so a client can use the system to target number in Israel for example but each client operates the system independently if he needs he can get support from any sort of staff this the the data the system collects also is saved locally it doesn't save in the cloud it doesn't transfer to some nso server in kafris in cyprus or in israel it saves locally in the client if nso gets a claim or a complaint of misuse by the system or by a client it will ha- it need to go physically to the client's premises get his permission to access the system mm. and check it check the logs which they say are untemperable by the client and inaccessible by the client to see how the system is being used can the client when pegasus arrives uh, and say it asks we want to know who uh, you're spying on can the client then deny permission he can deny permission hmm. uh, but then and so the option to terminate his contract immediately hmm. uh, they claim that they never been denied permission and it's nso not pegasus nso is the company pegasus is the product right so just to just to uh, summarize what you said you're saying that mm-hmm. if uh, say i want to install pegasus in in, in someone's uh, phone and snoop on there yes. like someone from nso will physically come uh, and set up the operating system set up the software after which i have the control of how i want to and who i want to snoop on and yes. if a complaint is received from someone only then pegasus gets access to the list of names that i might be snooping on and that is if i give them access and, and yes and they have to come physically to your premises they can't access it from afar 
And right. of course, it won't be you or me. It's only government and government agencies. Of course, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, we're curious about how this investigation has been reported in Israel. Is there a lot of pressure on the Israeli government to reflect on the operations of NSO? So, two questions here, actually. Uh, how it's important and how the government reacted. And it's been reported extensively. Uh, it's been major headlines in all the newspapers, even newspapers that are not part of the consortium, like Calcalis. The day after it came out, uh, it was our main story. I wrote it myself. So it, uh, it, it, it was opening a news broadcast on television. They talked about it on the radio. It made quite a stir. And again, because NSO is already a well-known company as well, and it's already somewhat explosive. And there was a lot of opinion article written by me, by other journalists, denouncing the company and denouncing the way the Israeli government is handling because the Israeli government is a regulator of NSO. Mm -hmm. Each country that NSO operates, it needs to get a permission or a license to export to this country from the Ministry of Defense. So the, the Israeli government has a, a lot of power to regulate it. It doesn't use it really well. And you ask how the government reacted. Well, there were some uh, denouncement, uh, superficial denouncement by some official uh, ministry. Uh, security minister Benny Gantz said they will check the, they will form a committee to check the claims. Uh, this is, I think, just words. Hmm. Because the Israeli government and the security administration here in Israel have very, its interests are very much aligned with those of NSO. NSO wanted to sell to various countries. The ministry, the security minister wanted to sell to those countries because Israel has political interests in those countries, diplomatic interests, financial interests, security interests, and other interests in those countries. And it was reported a, a week ago in the New York Times in the New York Times by my colleague, Israeli reporter Ronen Bergman, um, that after the murder of a Saudi journalist in Turkey, uh, Israeli security administration, the security ministry came to companies like NSO, like Kendu and other companies that are selling spiral to Saudi Arabia and told them, please keep working with Saudi Arabia, don't leave the country. Uh, so one of the companies actually withdrew from the, comp from the country after the murder, the, Israel, the security minister, administration asked them to go back to the country. And this is how we knew, everybody knew how the, security, uh, the Saudi Crown Prince was personally involved in the murder. So I wouldn't put a lot of hopes on the Israel or the security administration changing anything about the way NSO operates. And even if they do, even if they by somehow decide well, NSO is not allowed to operate anymore. It's not allowed to sell its software to any country. Nothing will change because, as I said, there's a lot of other companies in Israel and they will fill the void very quickly. And instead of NSO, you will have another company which is less inspected, less well known, and is doing the same thing, if not even worse things. Right. And now I think it might be important for us to come to the confusion that happened in India for the last two days, right? So, Umair, yeah. can you clarify to us what exactly happened? You interviewed NSO CEO Shalev Julio on the 20th, after which yeah. Amnesty releases a press statement in Hebrew. And then mm -hmm. you did the Amnesty uh, press statements report on the 21st. So I want yeah. to understand why did Amnesty feel uh, the necessity to even issue a press release? Okay. That's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't want to speak for them, but I can tell you what I understood from the spokesperson, and I might be mistaken, but uh, what he told me is there was a lot of misreporting here in Israel about the nature of the list. There was a lot of reports that insinuated or even claimed that the list is a equal of targets of NSO, meaning that every number on the list is a number of NSO that was targeted by Pegasus. Mm -hmm. And they never claimed that. Nobody from Amnesty or Forbidden Story claimed that. And they wanted to clarify that because it made them look like they were lying when NSO came out with the claims and said, we are not connected to the list at all. The list has no connection with us. It can be by the same way, a list of phone numbers from the yellow pages. It's actually what they were, one of the things Julio said uh, during, the, during this week. So, and wanted to clarify that for the local Israeli media. And also they wanted to clarify things that NSO were saying, that NSO were saying there is no connection 
we touch to the list. It's just a random list of numbers. They have some proof. I not I don't necessarily agree with them, but I, it's not irrefutable proof. It's not. It's not. Sorry, it's not. It's not. It's not. I didn't mean to say it's not irrefutable. It's not proof that it's based on nothing. They have some sort of evidence, maybe some circumstantial evidence of some connections between numbers on the list and NSO. I didn't say 67 devices from the list checked on more than half of them traces of Pegasus. Hmm. Some of the devices, some of the number appeared on the list a short time before being targeted by Pegasus. So it's not like it's complete, there's no connection at all. Some connection might be, its nature is not very clear, but it's not a random list of numbers. It's clear. So they wanted to, to clarify both sides of the issue. And yeah. what they were saying is A, is that the list is not a list of, of uh, numbers that were affected directly by Pegasus, there were of victims of Pegasus, and it's not a random list. Uh, if you want, I can just go to the statement and, and actually tell you exactly what they said. It's a very long statement, so I only read the relevant part, and I'm translating as I'm reading it, so it might be a little uh, confusing. I try to be a little confusing. Okay. So uh, NSO uh, presented the list as a, as, as it is not connected to, in, to its products at all, that it's saying it's a random list, and the real number are much smaller. The truth is that Amnesty never produced, never claimed the list as a list of victims of Pegasus spyware. If, although it's possible that some of the media around the world did it, Amnesty and the journalists that were part of the research and the media which, for which they are working have made it clear from the, from the, from the first part, from the start, sorry, in a, in a very clear language. That this is a list of numbers that mark as numbers of interest to NSO clients, which are very, which are various governments around the world. This mm. is the relevant part from the statement. Now, when the statement reads out that uh, it could possibly mis be misreported by media organizations across the world, right? Yes. So, is there a reason why the statement was issued uh, in Hebrew and not as an uh, Amnesty International statement across the world? I see no reason to that. I not I myself have not do not understand it. I talked with Gil Nave and Amnesty spokesperson Israel, and he said it was my decision to issue the statement because mm -hmm. I see a lot of misreporting or misrepresentation in the Israeli media. Mm -hmm. But uh, I still don't understand why uh, Amnesty didn't put out a similar statement in uh, English. Yeah. They did put out a very short statement yeah. saying that they stand by their story, but not elaborating as deeply as it did in his, his gilded in his um, statement to Israeli media. Mm. And this is part of the problem why there's a lot of misunderstanding around uh, Amnesty's statement. Yeah, which is what I want to come to next, where your report sort of becomes the center of attention, right? So if yeah. you can tell me a little briefly about uh, what your article really says, and unfortunately, how it was used by sections of the media, and I, I know of Indian media and how, how they've used it to create a lot of and fuel a lot of confusion. So what, what do you think led to this confusion? I think it's more for you to answer because I don't follow Indian media very closely or at all during my... My, my question can... really is, what part of your report do you think that they misunderstood or... Um, or, or confu got confused by, intentionally so, or unintentionally? So my report about the statement was pretty much straightforward. I, a lot of it is just, most of it is just quotes directly from the statement. I'm mm -hmm. even uh, tell you something that I'm not supposed to say. I just copy pasted a lot of it and put it in my report. I did give a headline and some uh, elaboration where it's needed, but mostly I just quoted directly from the statement. My headline was uh, that the uh, Amnesty clarifies 50,000 phone number list is not directly connected to NSO. And uh, I think it's a headline that pretty much summarized the story. And later when I talk with uh, Gil for MC, he said, well, this, uh, this headline actually is quite accurate because there's also said that in their report as well. Uh, mm -hmm. How was it misrepresented? How was it, mis or how was it misunderstood? Or was it intentionally or unintentionally? you are more qualified to answer it than I am mm. because I only have uh, been exposed to how it was misunderstood by mm. question being asked in interviews when I talked about it. So, and I didn't follow it. I didn't follow the original reporting about my, uh, my article. 
Right. But I was just curious because earlier when we were speaking, you said that you did feel in certain interviews that they yeah. were trying to ex- like bring out a certain kind of statement from you, right? So yeah. what do you think they were trying to elicit from you? And, and were they missing um, a nuance that you had reported? So I'm just trying to okay, understand. So I'm, 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 I'm thinking about, uh, I'm, I'm I have to, to say it because uh, I've got a feeling Mm-hmm. with some interviews. I don't want to say the names because I don't know the media really well. I don't want to, but I got to with some interviews uh, and the way they were presented afterwards, but the way they asked me questions that they were trying to lead me, to goad me or to prod me to say something damning of amnesty or the research, mm-hmm. something that's saying, well, it's whole thing is just a big lie. It's based on nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, I've got to think that's what they want me to say. Uh, the way the question is asked, that uh, you know, it was sometimes very leading questions. Like uh, one example was, "Do you think this also is a fishing expedition?" So um, this is the feeling that that I got. Mm. And I going on these interviews, I got I had before going on on the interview, I had a feeling it would be something like that because I know how a uh, biased media works. Uh, and I knew that uh, I might be uh, been prodded or goaded to say something that is damning, and I was very careful. And I think I succeeded, or at least I tried to succeed, not to say something like that. Because although I have problems and critics of the report, I think a lot of it is true and it uh, is best in fact. Uh, I do have a lot of critics, and maybe we can talk about that if you want. But I've but I don't, I'm, I'm just really giving very long answer. I don't want to do another one when I'm just talk, 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 talk. <laughs> It's completely fine, yeah. yeah. I think my colleague had a, had a question, actually. Yeah, so as you mentioned earlier and also said in your article when you interviewed NSO CEO, that mm-hmm. asking for more information about the source was only fair. But Forbidden Stories and Amnesty International trying to protect their source is also fair on their part. So as a journalist, you'd understand why it's important to protect your source. So why do you think in this case specifically, it's so important for us to know who the source is? I don't believe I said we need to know what, what the source, who leaked the press, who the source that leaked it. Mm-hmm. But they can give more information on when it's leaked from. Mm-hmm. And I want to give you an example. Uh, when the NSA documents that uh, Edward Snowden leaked broke out, the Guardian and the other media reporting it say it was document that leaked from NSA. They didn't say it was Edward Snowden. It only came out later when Snowden himself decided to reveal himself. He would, if he wouldn't have revealed himself as the source, you might never have known it was him. Okay. So we knew the source, the documents came from, from, the, from the NSA. We just didn't know how. And now we have a document, we don't know where it came from. Not even a tension, not even vaguely. So I think they need to give more information. They say, this document came from X. We know it's a, we know it's reliable because we know the source. We can tell you who the source is. And this is the point you have to believe us. And you know, if the Washington Post and the Guardian and Amnesty saying, believe me, uh, this document came from, I'm just saying, yes, it came from the NSA. I will believe them, even if they don't tell me the source because they say they believe the source. And I believe they did the uh, minimum checks to verify the source claim. And know that if the documents come from the NSA, then I can judge it by the source it came from. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is the, the, this is the situation. And it, I think we need to know where the document is came from, mm-hmm. from some private company, uh, not related to any source, from some sort of government uh, server. Uh, just something that we know what the source of the list. And I think, I believe it can be done without revealing the source who leaked it. I'm not sure, by the way, that there is a source that leaked it. Because mm-hmm. we know that a month ago, the, li- the list was circulating around various uh, operators. Uh, NSO, uh, Shalev Julio told me, we saw the list a month ago and we saw, and we were approached to it by a, a couple of data brokers, mm-hmm. one or two clients. Mm-hmm. And uh, he showed me uh, privately, confidentially, parts of the list mm-hmm. that I know didn't come from Amnesty. They, came, they got the list separately before Amnesty and Forbidden Stories came to them. So the list was circulating. 
mm. in the uh, shadow underworld, mm. as much one might say, of people operating in this area. So this is also a thing that we need to clarify. How did uh, Amnesty and Forbidden Stories came to have the list? Right. So you're not saying that you want to know who the source is, but you're saying it's important to know uh, where the source came from to confirm the credibility of the list. No, no. Of course, I want to know who the source is. <laughs> no, <laughs> I want to know. You're, you're standing I, by the fact that... But I'm not that expecting that. Yes. Hold on I to that. I don't think story. they need to... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I don't think they need to reveal the source itself. Right. Right. They need to reveal where this list came to. Of course, I want. I think everyone wants to know who the source is. Yeah. I'm not expecting them to do it. I don't think they need to do it. And I think it will be wrong of them to do it unless mm. the source itself, of course, allows them to do it. I think protecting your sources is one of the most important things you can do in a journal, as a journalist. And I'm absolutely not saying that they need to reveal the source. Got it. Got it. And before we let you go, Omer, I want to ask you one final question fun question you know what did yeah, okay. what did you think of being on an Indian uh, television debate was it loud was it civilized was it fun was it angry uh, what did you get it was very civilized uh, the part I've been it was everyone was really nice mm-hmm. it was a uh, somewhat very formal every time you call me sir and Mr Omar Kabir and know uh, in Israeli media we are just we are a lot less formal I will never you Uh, when contact a source or interview, I will never call him sir or doctor or professor or whatever. I'll just call, hey, Alon, or hey, Anat, or whatever. And when talking online and talking in a broadcast, we don't say, well, Mr. Omer Kabir, can you tell him what we just say? So, Omer, what do you think? It's, uh, it's somewhat a lot more firmer, but it's been uh, very fun. Everyone was really polite. And uh, even when they were trying to go to me, uh, the question, they were asking it really nicely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and a lot of the time, these sort of discussions in Israeli media can very fast degenerate into accusations, shouting, uh, even cursing sometimes, especially when talking about the state-aligned media, which is very one-sided towards the state or some sort of a side of the political aisle. When talking with someone from the other side, a lot of the time it can very tenuous, can come even very personally tenuous. It wasn't the case at all. It's actually, it's a very pleasant experience. And I did, I did a lot of the, the six, seven interviews, one after another. Yeah. And it's very fun. I know, uh, I think a billion people in India, I think more people in India saw me yesterday. Yeah. Uh, then uh, then all the people in Israel that ever saw a story of mine in all the 10 11 years I'm working as a journalist so uh, I might you might say I'm Indian fam- I'm India famous I think a lot of people that even we at news laundry often criticize will be very happy to hear that you believe that Indian media is fairly civilized my 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 my, my uh, comparison is Israel media so right <laughs> yeah. I understand. And, you know, my colleague and I, Supriti, uh, and I have published a report uh, today yeah. titled No One Says Pegasus List is Fake. Why are BJP leaders and their media allies insisting it is? You can find our report on the website, newsroundy.com. Um, thank you, Omer, for taking the time out and being patient enough to answer our questions. There's so much detail. I'm sure it's going to offer a lot of clarity to our viewers and listeners. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you both. Thank you very much for having me. We, being an independent platform, depend on our readers, viewers and listeners. Support independent media by subscribing to News Laundry. Go to newslaundry.com, click on the subscribe button at the top and pay to keep news free.